Today our scripture reading will be found in Luke 6, verses 27 through 36. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also, and whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Thank you. you may be seated. Kids are dismissed for junior church. Imagine with me for a second that one morning you are woken up out of your sleep with crashing and banging ringing in your ears. You might spend a little bit of time half awake wondering if you're dreaming at first. Um, if you live in a row house, you might spend a couple seconds trying to determine if the noise is coming from your own house or from the house next door. But if after a couple of more blows and shatters come to your ears and you determine that it is coming from your house, you would probably be instantly, fear, uh, instantly filled with a, a pretty intense fear, right? Someone is in your house there you can hear the, the sheetrock falling to the ground and you would start to be thinking about where your phone is to call 911 or where your self-defense weapon of choice is because there's something is causing all this destruction from below you. Your view of that situation would suddenly change if all of a sudden you remember that you've hired a contractor to renovate your dining room. You'd given them a key to get started early. You're still hearing the same noise, but you know that the reason for that sound is now firm in your mind. Knowing who is doing the work, knowing what they're trying to accomplish would settle down your fears. Of course, it's also true that as you came down the stairs, if you saw this mess that a contractor was making as they're um, doing these massive renovations in your house, you would still be a little unsettled, right? If you've ever had work done on your house, um, it's, it's messy, right? It's, it's uh, a little disorienting. All of your stuff that you normally have in the place where it's supposed to go isn't there. Um, the, the mess kind of spills over into other rooms. It's this major headache. It's this major project. So even if you expected the project, and even if you expected the contractor showing up at your house, it's still uncomfortable. There's a really well-known quote, maybe you've heard it before, by C.S. Lewis, where he says that God is doing major renovations in our life. This is what he says. He says, imagine yourself as a living house. God comes in to rebuild the house. At first, perhaps, you can understand what he's doing. He's getting the drains right and stopping the leaks in the roof and so on. You knew that these jobs needed doing, and so you're not surprised. But presently, he starts knocking the house about in a way that hurts abominably and does not seem to make any sense. What on earth is he up to? The explanation is... He is building a quite different house from the one you thought of. 
throwing out a new wing there, putting on an extra floor there, running up towers, making courtyards. You thought you were being made into a decent little cottage, but he is building a palace. He intends to come and live in it himself. What C.S. Lewis is saying is that God does not come and did not save us to make some tiny little surface changes. Some little minor repairs on some little things wrong in our life that we would like to be fixed. God doesn't just do tinkering here and there. When God comes to renovate your life, the reason that he saved you is to do major renovations. He's busting down walls. He's rearranging the floor plan. He's building something completely new. God is doing the unexpected in our lives. And our text of scripture this morning is a reminder of how drastic these renovations are that God is doing. If you're a Christian here this morning, these verses are a radical overhaul in how you have your life arranged. In these last weeks that we've been studying the sermon in the plain here in, in Luke chapter 6, we've seen how Jesus has transformed our identity. The whole way that we view ourselves has changed now because of what Jesus has told us. Whole new way to see the world, a whole new set of values. And now, in these verses this morning, Jesus tells us how to live, how to treat people how to handle problems in our interactions with people. And it's not just a new coat of paint or fixing a little leak in the roof. Jesus has a whole new way of treating people. We can never read these verses without them smashing down in our own ideas about relationships. We can never hear these commands from Jesus without walls being busted down in our lives. Why? Because Jesus tells us in these verses that Jesus is calling you to unexpected love. Jesus is calling you to unexpected love. It's the exact opposite of how we would normally respond to people. It's the opposite of how we would be expected to respond, right? What does Jesus say? Jesus kind of sets apart what he's saying here and says to anybody who's listening, in other words, not just listening, like letting the words fall on your ears. Obviously, everybody within the sound of his voice was listening. But when Jesus says this, he's saying to anybody who's really listening, it's like when he says, you know, hear ye, hear ye, verily, verily. Jesus is saying, this is, this is important. To anybody who's listening, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. Jesus gives us four commands in these two verses. And the first one is obviously simple. Love your enemies. And then the next three kind of explain what Jesus meant by that. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. We all have different types of ways of really, I think, in our human hearts trying to ignore Jesus's words here because we could, you know, you'd be tempted to say, well, I don't have any enemies, you know, I just have friends, so I don't, you know, I don't have to worry about loving my enemies, I don't have any enemies, but that's not really what Jesus, Jesus isn't saying you need to have like an arch nemesis that's out to get you in order to obey these verses. Jesus is talking about people who are acting like your enemies, people who are working against you, um, it's anyone who hates you. In other words, internally, they don't like you. They curse you verbally. They're saying things against you. Or then it moves to actual action. They mistreat you. They do wrong to you. So how does Jesus tell us to treat people in our lives that don't like us, that hurt us, that say mean things against us? Jesus says we're to love them. This is a good verse to go to when it, we talk about what the Bible's idea of love is. Um, R.C. Sproul says it well, love has more to do with activity than it has to do with feeling. Our world today, and in our language today, we use the word love, but most of the time that we use the word love, we use it in the sense of a passive feeling. In other words, how does something or someone make me feel? 
So someone will say, I love tacos, right? And what they mean by that is that they like the feeling that tacos give them. Um, that's, that's how we use it often in English. Unfortunately, that's how we often use it when we're talking about love for other people. Um, we'll say, I love that person, but what we're saying in that moment is, I like how that person makes me feel. But that's not the, the Bible's idea of love. And you can see it right here in these verses when Jesus tells us to love our enemies. If we're supposed to love our enemies, Jesus isn't commanding us to have warm and fuzzy feelings towards people who work against us. Jesus gives us activity, things that we can do, a kind-hearted initiative that we take towards other people to do good, to bless, to pray. That's the Bible's definition of love. It's an active choice to do good and to work for someone else's benefit. I like what Andrew Peterson says in one of his songs, that love is not a feeling in your chest, it's bending down to wash another's feet. Barely tolerating people isn't love. Ignoring people isn't love. Purposely putting people on the back burner isn't love. Jesus says here the type of love that he's talking about is an active love. Purposely doing good things for people. Using your mouth to say good things about people. Using your time and energy to pray to your heavenly father on people's behalf. So this definition of love doesn't work with tacos, right? If, you're, if, if you can interchange tacos and people in the sentence, then it's not biblical love, right? You're not working actively on the benefit of tacos, right? You're not sacrificing for the taco. You don't have the taco's best interest at heart. In fact, it's quite the opposite, right? That you just care about what the taco is going to do for you. And when it comes to tacos, that's fine. When it comes to people... And Jesus' idea of what real love is, it's different. Jesus is talking here about an active love. Now, we might be tempted to say, wow, this sounds really good. This is interesting stuff here from Jesus. Jesus is talking about how we should love people. We should even love our enemies. Great idea. Interesting philosophy. This is very, you know, this is something that's very interesting to discuss. But the thing is, that very next thing that Jesus says is that he's expecting us to actually do this. It's not just a, a nice little saying that you could, like, you know, put on a Snapple bottle or on a tea box and say, oh, this is what everybody should be doing. It's not just something for philosophers to debate. Jesus is saying, you're going to actually do this in your life. You're going to love specifically. Look at the next couple of verses. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, don't withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, don't demand it back. So Jesus gives real-life situations, specific circumstances, that he's saying you are to obey these words of mine. If someone attacks you, they smack you, you don't retaliate. If somebody robs you, you offer them even more than what they take. If someone asks you for something, it seems like the idea here is like borrowing from you because in the next verse it says, Jesus says, you know, you, you don't demand it back. Jesus says that we should love actively, but what he's saying here is that we should love specifically. There should be real, concrete situations in our lives when we obey these verses. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. If you ever read a verse, and your first reaction is to explain it away instead of obey it, then you know that you're on the wrong track. And I'll just admit to you that as I read these verses in my human heart, and I think all of us as we approach these verses, we think, well, it doesn't mean that. But I would just submit to you that these are the words of our Savior and that this is what Jesus has told us to do. Jesus, it, it, it tells us to do something hard here. 
Jesus is in the middle of radically renovating your life, of changing the way that you treat people, and this is what it looks like. This is the blueprint that Jesus is working off of as the contractor that's redesigning your life. And he's telling you, this is what it's going to look like. That if, if somebody smacks us, instead of striking back, we offer them the other cheek. If someone takes advantage of us, we, in some sense, leave ourselves exposed again for that to happen. I think it's worth saying, sure, you know, Jesus isn't talking about somebody who's attacking you and trying to kill you, right? It's not, he's not giving specific self-defense situations. That's not really what's in view here. Although, that being said, throughout the, his, throughout the rest of the Bible and throughout the history of the church, Christians have gone to their death obeying these verses. Jesus is on the cross praying for the people who were killing him. Stephen goes to his death, being stoned to death, and is praying to the Lord for the people who are stoning him. You go throughout the, any part of church history, and you'll find Christians marching to their death, obeying these words. But there's still nothing in these verses that says that, sure, there's situations where you're going to use uh, legal protection or, you know, use the government. Paul does that, right? Paul's about to get whipped at one point, and he says, oh, you know, by the way, I'm a Roman citizen. Um, and then the soldiers are like, oh, man, I guess we can't whip this guy, you know, it changed the situation. Paul, at certain times in his life, had his life threatened, and he ran. It wasn't like he just always put his own life in danger. Um, so there's certainly nothing in these verses that means we should place ourselves in abusive situations where we're in physical danger. Jesus isn't talking about war or self-defense or legal situations. There's biblical principles that all apply there. There's, there's wisdom for how we apply this. But if we spend all of our time on extreme situations where we say, oh, the verse doesn't apply here, then I think we miss the point of the everyday situations where we really should be clearly obeying these words. It's what Jesus does say here that matters, right? Jesus doesn't mean this. He doesn't mean that. And then we're like, okay, well, moving on to the next verse. <laughs> but let's just stop for a second and think, this is what Jesus told us to do. Jesus says that if someone mistreats us publicly, purposefully, we don't retaliate. In fact, that our heart is so filled with love that we do the unexpected. We go even further and offer the other cheek. Somebody robs us of something that's legitimately ours, and we actually offer them even more. Someone borrows something from us, and we don't even ask for it back. This is what I'm talking about when I say that Jesus is calling you to an unexpected love here. We need wisdom in applying these verses, but that doesn't mean that we don't have actual situations in our life where we do need to obey them. Jesus calls us to an active love, a specific love. And also, he calls us here to a thoughtful love. In case I think Jesus knows our hearts, that we want to get kind of caught up in Jesus' examples here. Well, if the person hits you on the cheek, but it's like not that hard, then you can turn the other cheek. But if it's, you know, if they're, you know, they're, they're taking your life, you know, or you might, your life might be in danger, then it's okay. But Jesus here isn't about, he's giving the specific concrete situations but that's not like an exhaustive list. Jesus is talking about our heart that has been changed by him. So just in case we would get caught up in the specific situations that Jesus gives, he gives us kind of the blanket statement, treat others in the same way you want them to treat you. That part of what love is, is thoughtfully considering on the other person's behalf what the right thing to do is, right? That, that love, because it's not just a passive feeling, it's an active um, choice that you're making to engage in this person's life, is thinking through, how would I want to be treated in that situation? Um, this idea was pretty common in Jesus' day. Other rabbis had said this. Um, other philosophers um, had said this, even outside Christianity. One of, the, one of the rabbis, years before Jesus, said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. 
Um, the, what everyone says, what all the scholars say, uh, is that Jesus is the first one that states it positively, which again reinforces the fact that biblical love is active. Everyone else just said, well, don't do it to the person if you wouldn't want them to do it to you. Jesus is the first one that puts it actively and positively and says, treat others the way you want them to treat you. So here are Jesus' words to us. Jesus says, I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also. Whoever takes away your coat, don't withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. So I know this is going to sound crazy, but here's my radical take on these verses. We're supposed to obey them. Jesus calls you to unexpected love. In other words, Jesus is calling you to love specific people in your life with an active, over-the-top, prayerful spirit. And again, you don't need an, an arch nemesis like in the cartoons or the movies of somebody who is spending their every waking moment trying to be out there to get you. You don't need somebody like that in your life to love. You just have regular people in your life to love. I do hope we get a chance, and we should practice this in front of strangers, right? People that don't know us at all. You know, we're, we're all about loving people and being kind-hearted people, and then you're in line, and the 10 items are less lane, and the person in front of you has 35 things stacked in their cart. And at that moment, you feel, you know, you, you have, we struggle to love someone in that situation, right? I do think that it's changed how we meet and how we talk to strangers. It's possible at one point in time in our life, one of us will face persecution, and we'll get to go to our death praying for the people who murdered us. But for the most part, I would submit to you that the real place for you to obey these verses are with the people that are closest to you. Somebody has to be within arm's length in order to smack you on the cheek. It's typically the people who hurt us the most that are the closest to us. And Jesus calls you to show unexpected love towards the people in your life. Your spouse, your kids, your neighbors, your co-workers, church members, people in your shepherd group. You are called to love people with an unexpected love in actual, specific situations. When people hurt you, when they annoy you, when they bother you, they take things from you, those are the exact situations that Jesus is talking about here, and he's given us clear directions on what to do. You know, there's an old saying in boxing, they say it in sports a lot, that everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I think that's a lot of what is, it kind of applies here when it comes to loving people. If you ask somebody, you know, oh, do I love people? Oh, I love people. You know, do you love that person? Oh, no, I don't like that person. They did that to me one time, you know. You know, do you love people? Oh, I love people. Oh, but that, that, you wouldn't believe what my spouse did to me last week, you know. Um, when it comes down to the actual doing of it, we are not as good at it as we think we are. What's interesting to me is that most of the time when we talk about loving people, and then we bring up specific people or specific situations, and then we say, well, but in that situation, you just got to understand, nobody could expect me to love that person in that situation. I mean, you wouldn't believe how my kids were acting that day. You wouldn't believe what they were talking about. You wouldn't believe how ungrateful they were. You know, you wouldn't believe what my spouse had done after all this that I did for them. You wouldn't believe what this person said to me after church. So of course, it's totally understandable, explainable that in this situation, I don't have to love them. But Jesus' whole point is, that's the exact situation that you do need to love them. Jesus is calling you to an unexplainable love, a surprising love. Jesus is, is calling you to a, a different love here. So in those situations where you say, oh, well, there's absolutely no way that I could do this in this situation. I mean, nobody could expect me to love this person in this situation. 
That's the exact situation Jesus is talking about. This is a high calling. Jesus has given us a, a tall order, right? This is not easy. So maybe you're reading these verses, and if you're following along with me here this morning, you're thinking, this is a nice idea. Sure, it sounds good, but I just don't know. I just don't know if this is ever going to really happen. You know, it, it, it kind of sounds nice that Jesus says this, but I don't know how I could ever actually love this person in this situation. You know, you just don't even understand how hard it is. It couldn't happen. Well, keep reading in this passage because Jesus has explained to us the type of love that he's asking us to show. And now in these verses, he shows us the reasons that we should love this way. So the first reason that we're supposed to love this way is that this is a different kind of love. It sets us apart from those that don't know him at all. Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. So Jesus, again, I think as really a master teacher, um, Jesus is repeating the same thing. He's going to actually repeat it one more time in this text. Just to make sure, in case you missed it the first time, in case we're like still trying to mentally get out of this. So if Jesus didn't really mean that, Jesus says it again here. Jesus says, if you just love people who love you, that's not a big deal. If you just do good to people so that they'll do good to you, or you just borrow, let somebody borrow from you who you know is going to pay you back, that's not anything special. A lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, I mean, I'm a very you know, loving person. I just all the time love people. But then when they describe the situations, and if they were really being honest, they're only describing situations where they get something back out of it where it's easy to love, where it's expected to love, like the normal situations, right? But Jesus says that expected love isn't what he's talking about here. Jesus is talking about unexpected love. John Bunyan said, you've never really lived until you've done something for someone who can never repay you. Jesus says the love that's in view here is a love you don't get paid back for. So it would have been nice if Jesus had said that showing this kind of unexpected love was like an optional part of Christianity, you know? There's going to be a few special holy Christians that are going to attain to this a few times in their life, but other than that, the rest of you, you know, just kind of, no, I'm not really expecting that from you. But what does he say here? Jesus says that this is the love that sets us apart as his followers. This is the the this thing that's going to identify to everyone that we are his. Um, the, he says, he talks about sinners here, which are people who are, yes, that are sinful like we think of it, but in the, this context and in the, in the Gospels, the way it's used is those who were clearly outside of the fold. Those were who were clearly not part of the community, right? People who had been cast out. So Jesus says, if you're mine, this is how you're going to identify this is how people are going to be able to know that you're mine. So here's Jesus, basically at the beginning of his ministry, one of his first major sermons to all of his followers, all these people interested in following him, and he says, listen, here's going to be my followers thing. You know, probably some people in the audience were asking that, thinking that. You know, like, what's going to be Jesus' disciples, like, thing? Every religion has a thing. Every religion has something that, as soon as you see that person, as soon as you even just look at them. A lot of times you can identify what religion they are, what they believe, right? Buddhist monks, they have robes, right? You know as soon as you see them. Mormons have their shirt and ties. Orthodox Jews have their haircuts. They have the hats, the beards. A lot of times you'll see Roman Catholics with a rosary bead. Um, you can always tell if someone's a Muslim, right? They have a burqa. Um, the women do. So what's the thing for followers of Jesus? Like, what's our thing? What's the thing that people see in us and they're like, ah, that person's a follower of Jesus? It, it's not bumper stickers or t-shirts. Some Christians have tried that. That's not what Jesus says here. What does Jesus say? Jesus says, my followers are going to have this unexplainable, over-the-top love. Early in the church, there's this man named Tertullian. This is only like first or second century one of the early church fathers, he was writing about the church's reputation in Rome. 
And he said that in, in Rome, they had this saying um, about the Christians, and this is what they said, see how these Christians love. That was the church that turned the Roman Empire upside down. It wasn't because this church had a lot of money. That church didn't have a lot of money in that time. It wasn't because they weren't persecuted. They were persecuted. It wasn't because they were cool and relevant and just everybody thought they were so great. It was because those believers had a real, unexpected love for others. Jesus draws a different dividing line between his followers and people who are not his followers. And it isn't between formal religion and non-religion. It isn't between what you tell yourself or what you call yourself. Jesus says that his followers are known by showing unexpected love. Somebody said the test of Christianity isn't only loving Jesus, it's also loving Judas. Jesus washed Judas' feet. Knew, knew exactly what, Jesus, what Judas was getting ready to go do with those clean feet. This is what sets us apart. This is what we're supposed to be known by. So there's the first main motivation of why you should show unexpected love in your life. It shows that you're different. It shows that you are actually a follower of Jesus. And to be honest, this is where some people decide not to follow Jesus. This is, and this is where people decided not to follow Jesus back then. There were a lot of people that were really interested in following Jesus when he was talking about, you know, handing out bread. Oh, there's free food? Ah, I like this Jesus guy. There were a lot of people that wanted to follow Jesus when they thought he was going to meet their political goals, where, you know, Jesus is going to overthrow these Romans, and I don't like the Romans either. So let me, I'm going to follow Jesus. This sounds good. But, but Jesus didn't come to do those things. Jesus didn't come to hand out bread. Jesus comes to renovate our lives, to change what we love, and to change how we love. Jesus takes a sledgehammer out and starts knocking down walls in our lives. The whole way that we normally treat people, the whole way that we do relationships, Jesus is changing it all. And that's why people today still decide not to follow him. There's people that are fine with going to church. They even like the idea of Jesus. But then there's certain things in their life they will not let go of. There are people that they hate, and, and if they, they might not ever say it this way, but if they were honest, they would say, I want to hold on to that hatred. I want to hold on to this way that people haven't done everything that they're supposed to do. And that's all I'm holding on to. And if I have to let go of that, well, then forget following Jesus. Jesus says, this is how my people are known. This is how they're identified. It's a radical transformation that Jesus is calling us to. I'll put it this way, too. I think that if you're a follower of Jesus... There's, you have a desire to get down to really following Jesus. Like, like really living the Christian life, right? Like really doing it, right? Like what's the moment in your life? What's, what's the time period in your week that you're really following Jesus? And we have kind of the desire, like I want to do something for the Lord. And not just something little, like I want to do something big for God, Right? What does that look like? What is the moment in time in your life, even just in your week, in your month, in your year, that like rubber meets the road, this is it. This is Christianity. This is me living for Jesus. Th that moment, I would submit to you, yes, part of that is just your time in the word. It is worshiping and being with other believers. But I would say based on these verses, Christianity is the moments in your life that you give people an unexpected love. A love that they do not deserve. That is what Jesus is calling us here for. Jesus says that unexpected love is at the very heart of what it means to be a Christian. So that's the first motivation for why you can show unexpected love in your life. It sets us apart. It shows that there's a difference between 
the world and between us as Jesus' followers. But here's the second one, and it's, it's even better. It's even bigger. Jesus says, but love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return. So Jesus is really repeating himself here for the third time. Make sure that we don't miss it. And your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. So Jesus, here again, he reiterates what he's been saying, but he says, you do all of this, why? You do it for a reward. Your reward in heaven will be great. So expecting heavenly reward enables you to show unexpected love. There's just no way to live the Christian life without counting on heaven. And Jesus has been talking about this so, so much already in this sermon, that heaven is where the hungry are finally filled. It's where the weeping are finally comforted. It's where the persecuted um, finally get paid back. And here he says, this, you are going to be rewarded for every single time that you show unexpected love. Every single situation, every time that you show active love in the face of pain and unfairness and opposition, Jesus says we get paid back. Your reward in heaven will be great. I think a lot of the times that we're, we're hesitant and that we struggle to show this kind of unexplainable um, unexpected love is because we think if I do that, I'm going to lose out. If I show that kind of love to people, people are going to walk all over me. People aren't going to give me back really what I deserve. And uh, people are going to, it's just not going to be worth it. But you hear, you see what Jesus says here, right? We're going to get rewarded in heaven. Followers of Jesus are waiting for a different payday. It's not the payday that we get from people. Everybody finally recognizes me, or I, everybody, I finally get to pay back everybody for what they did to me. That's not the payday that we're living for. The payday that people who don't know Jesus, all they have is stuff in this life. But the reason that we can show an unexpected love to the people around us is that we have a different payday, a heavenly reward that we are waiting for and that we're expecting. And then, because our God is just so generous and more incredible than we can ever imagine, it honestly keeps getting better as you read in these verses. Jesus says, you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and ev evil men. So the first part of the promise is you're going to get rewarded. The second part is it's proof, and it's the process of us being like God. We get to imitate him. We automatically imitate the people that we're around, and of course we ins instinctively imitate the people that we look up to. You can remember as a kid, if you watched baseball at all, you would imitate the batting stance of your favorite ball player. Uh, maybe, maybe if you had, you know, uh, movie stars or somebody on a show that you liked, you might try to dress like them. Probably the clearest example is how every single kid, and I've never seen a parent coach their kid to do this, but every little kid at some point in time tries to put on their parents' shoes, right? There's something that's adorable about that. There's something that's just instinctive um, in, in little kids that they do that, right? I can't help but show a picture of my girls when they were little, when they did this. This is the picture that comes to my mind, right? A little kid's face beaming with joy because they are imitating their parents. So how do we love people? Like, I'm talking about love people who are hard to love. Love situations where it's hard to love, where you're not going to get anything back. How do you do that? How do you love your spouse when they've been unkind to you? How do you love your kid when they're being ungrateful? How do you love the person at church that just seems to get under your skin? How do you love the person in line in front of you that has 35 things and the 10 items are less lame? 
How do you ever really show that unexpected love in that moment? Well, what Jesus says here is, the reason that we do it is because we want to imitate our Father. We want to be like Him. We want to show over-the-top, unexpected love because it's like, it's like putting on the shoes of our Heavenly Father. Can we fill those shoes? Absolutely not. But does that stop us from trying? No. We put those shoes on of unexpected love. If you know God, you want to be like him. It's impossible to say that you're a Christian and then say, but I don't want to be like him. It just isn't possible. We're made to imitate God. We're made to be like him. It's interesting that in the garden, Satan plays on this desire of Adam and Eve, right? Satan says to them, you will be like God. And he offers them what they see and what they know, right? He says, you can see this fruit here you're not supposed to eat, and you're going to know. Your eyes are going to be opened. You're going to have this knowledge that you've never had before. But that's not the way that we are made to imitate our Heavenly Father in what we can see. We wish we could see everything. We wish we could know everything. That would be nice. But we don't. That's not how we imitate God. How do we imitate our Heavenly Father? As human beings, we are designed to imitate Him. We imitate him by loving like him. The proof that we're his kids is that we love people like he does. The text says that God loves ungrateful, evil people. Think about this. A person in this life can live their whole life hating God. They can can shake their fist at heaven. They can curse God with their mouth. They can walk around on this planet and breathe God's air. They can eat the food that God's created for them, right? The most wicked person, the person that hates God. They might even try to to hurt God's image bearers. They might hurt God's people. And yet, their whole life, God gives them a lot of good things. Wicked, evil people get to eat bacon, right? They get to eat cheesesteaks, right? They get to eat all the delicious food that we get to eat too. Why? Why does, why does God let them do that? Because he's full of mercy. He's compassionate. He gives people things they don't deserve. And of course, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, we really understand this, right? Ungrateful, evil people. Have you ever been ungrateful? Have you ever sinned against God? I mean, we would all have to say, yeah, there's been all these times. And yet, how has God treated us? He hasn't just barely tolerated us. He hasn't just pushed us off to the side and said, well, maybe one day if you do better. Jesus, he's given us Jesus. He is full of mercy and compassion towards us. And Jesus says, if you've experienced unexplainable love from God, then you can show unexpected love to the people around you. Jesus' point here is that the proof that you're God's child is that you show love like God does. If you know God, you want to be like him. Nobody can say, yeah, I'm a Christian, I'm a follower of Jesus, but if anybody treats me this way, I'm going to handle them. They're going to get it. I'm going to make sure they pay. Jesus says those ideas, those thoughts are like saying, well, I'm not one of God's children. If you know him, you want to be like him. If you love him, you want to be like him. If you believe that he's been kind and compassionate to you, then you want to show that same kindness and compassion to the people who are closest to you. This is where unexpected love comes from. A situation, a person, where all you want to do is make sure they pay. Make sure they get what they deserve. But instead of snapping back verbally, emotionally, even sometimes physically, you show an unexpected love. You give kindness and favor and help and blessing that that other person doesn't deserve. Where does that type of love come from? Well, it comes from God. It comes from believing that he's going to reward you and because you want to imitate him. Do you notice something that happens 
And it actually happens right here in this text as you read through it, where it starts with uh, somebody who is hurting you. It, ha- it starts with somebody who's confronting you. It starts with a conflict and a person where you're looking over here and this person's done something, right? And you're looking at them and then you hear Jesus's words of how to handle that situation. And Jesus says, don't retaliate. You're looking at Jesus. Well, what, how, how could I not retaliate in this situation? And, and Jesus says, you know, you don't retaliate. retaliate. You, you, you love, you bless. And you're looking at Jesus, and you're thinking about, how can I do that? And then Jesus says, I'm going to reward you. And then Jesus says, and you'll be like my Father who's shown you mercy. You see where your focus has changed, where you were looking at this person, what they've done, how could they do this to you, and all of a sudden your gaze has shifted. You're looking up. You're looking at God who's shown you mercy. He's given you what you don't deserve. And if you have an opportunity, just one chance to obey Jesus, to do what he's called you to do, and give somebody a love that they don't deserve, that's a privilege. That's a high calling. That's a blessing that we would get to be like our Father. And that brings us joy. It brings him joy. Even if you don't follow sports that much, you probably know that the Stanley Cup is the the trophy for, you know, it's a trophy for winning the championship in the National Hockey League. And really, it's the best trophy out of all the sports because it's the only trophy that they pass around the same trophy from team to team each year. And whatever team wins it gets all of their names engraved on the cup. So they, I think they've done, over the years, they've, they've retired certain layers of it or whatever, but the actual Stanley Cup is just filled with these people's names. So that makes this story a little bit different because in 1924, the Montreal Canadiens won the Stanley Cup on neutral ice in Ottawa. And after all the celebrations at the stadium and in the locker room, they all piled into their own individual cars. This is 1924, you know, they don't have the team buses yet. And while they were going to Ottawa, one of the cars had a flat tire. They had the Stanley Cup in the back, so they had to move the Stanley Cup out of the trunk to get to all the tools and the spare tire and everything. Then they all got the tire changed, all hopped back in, got to Ottawa for the celebrations to continue, and there was no Stanley Cup. And they panically, you know, these guys, I'm sure you imagine how much they're panicking, they lost the Stanley Cup and had to go back and find it, and it was right where they left it, by the side of the road. You know, you think about, it's every hockey player's dream to one day hold that Stanley Cup. I mean, ever since they started playing in Pee Wee League, they're like, I'm gonna play, one day I'm gonna win the championship. Um, If you had asked them at the beginning of the season, why are you playing this season? Oh, for the Stanley Cup, you know. Then, well, why do you, you know, the playoffs, those guys are probably injured. They're, they're out there giving it their all. Why are they doing that? Oh, they're going to get the Stanley Cup. And then once they got it, all of a sudden, they lost it, right? They, they, they had their focus on something so much, and then in all the busyness and distraction of life, it's easy for us to misplace the most important things. And in our Christian life, we can very, very easily lose focus on what really matters. There's one little problem, maybe one major problem, uh, a series of events, and all of a sudden we've lost focus on what Jesus really wants us to do and what the Christian life is really all about. What is the Christian life all about? It's about knowing mercy and showing mercy. It's about enjoying and experiencing the incredible love of God and then because of that, showing an unexplainable love to the people around us. That's the prize that we're after, knowing God's love and showing God's love. And I think it's too often that we have kind of explained away these words of Jesus. And we've, it, it, it's ironic to me that many unbelievers who will read these words of Jesus and say, oh, that's good, you know, yeah, that's a nice thing. Of course, they don't really know Jesus. They they can't live this way without him. 
but yet that's their one takeaway from Jesus. And yet as believers, it's not just our one takeaway. I mean, this is what we're living. We're trying to live this out. Are we doing it perfectly? Absolutely not. But does that mean we're not trying? It shouldn't, right? Jesus has called us to an unexplained, an unexpected love to the people around us. Whether that's our kids, our spouse, other Christians, we have to ask for God's help to show this kind of love because this is what he's called us to. He's called us to love the people who are closest to us. So I just want to say to you, if there's somebody in your life who God is working in your heart and you know you haven't been loving them the way you should, ask the Lord's forgiveness. He's full of mercy. He's so good and so kind. Maybe you have a person who you need to ask their forgiveness for. But make up your mind that you're going to follow Jesus' words here. And we can pray and ask the Lord this week. Maybe he'll give us a chance to show some kind-hearted, over-the-top, undeserved love to the people in our lives. Because obeying these verses is at the heart of what it means to be a Christian. Love your enemies and do good. Lend expecting nothing in return. And your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, work in our hearts. Do the, the renovating work that only your Holy Spirit can do and only your word can do. Lord, give us a, a greater desire to obey these words that you've given to us. Give us a, a deeper longing to see your mercy again and to be overwhelmed by that. Lord, give us the grace and the strength and the wisdom that we need to show an unexpected love to the people in our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.